So here we are again at the integral chat of Sunday, the 12th of May, 2019. And today we wanted to just talk about quadrants and what they are useful for, if they are useful, just an, an over, overall conversation about that before I thought to dive into all the single quadrants once at a time. And as I told you, Ryan, I will be there next time, but then for three times I won't be there. So you need to, to do all the quadrants. So let's do the one who you like <laughs> worse next time. <laughs> so we start with a short check-in. Uh, I'm Heidi, I'm in Italy. Uh, it's raining just now, yesterday we were lucky because we have nearby in Narnia, it is called Narnia, but it's the story of Narnia. We had a historic um, event and a huge, long, long, long um, procession, let's say, in historic uh, clothings. It was, I think, 500 people walking by in beautiful costumes and the, the drums, you know, the drums and the trumpets. I think four or five bands coming with these drums and when they pass you, that's a memory of, you know, of the beginning of humanity, I think, which is in, in ourselves. So from the earliest stage of our human <laughs> time, I think, Jeremy, you know it better from when, when the drums started to be, but I had the feeling of, oh, not really. Great. So that's me in Italy. Who wants to go next? I can go, but I'm not sure what I need to, what, what, what is the check-in? Just say how you are and what, what is so for you today. You can also say something about what you would be interested in, or some, but not necessarily. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that's um, been really coming up for me recently is just uh, some clarity around community and uh, how I, so most of my life I've been focused on the, you know, kind of top left quadrant, which is very much my, uh, my and other people's internal psychology. Um, I do some life coaching and that's very much focused on uh, getting, you know, the whole uh, wake up, grow up, clean up, show up. Uh, kind of integral framework um, and the idea of just in the last few days I've realized um, and, and re reevaluated my mission and purpose in life I'm very purpose driven mission driven um, to be not only awakening individuals but the value of community and the value of creating cultural contexts um, where we come together and then the the whole that we create is so much more than the sum of its parts and then our, the way that our identity um, can live in that. Um, it just, it's, it's amazing how individualistic our society is and there's so much pathology that's coming out of that. Um, you know, and, I, and I think uh, the powers that be in some ways might want to keep us separate, but coming together in very authentic ways. And I think Heidi, you're also interested in this in terms of building community. So I guess what's coming up for me in my space right now is the value of connection, community, coming together in authentic contexts, um, in harmonious ways, in possibly self-organizing systems, things like that. And that's one of the reasons I'm so happy to have found this group as well, uh, where integral thinkers can come and share. We're all, all over the world, all different parts, uh, but we have the same um, the same outlook in, in, in this one particular way at least. Is, is the connect, you know, the Wilbur, the integral connection. So I'm very grateful to be here. And you are in Spain. I'm in Spain, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll pop in here. Um, so, a quick check in. My name is Jeremy. I'm coming in from St. Petersburg, Florida. And, um, yeah, my, my background is kind of interesting. I was very involved and still very involved in the integral theory community for many years. Um, but I've also been deeply involved with the Gibsarian expression of integral theory, uh, integral consciousness. And of course, I've written about that uh, quite a bit. And I'm always interested in sort of dialogues between Wilberians and Gibsarians and, and all of these sort of integral oriented thinkers and philosophers. And um, as usual, you know, I find uh, the most fruitful 
insights come from these differing approaches to the same new reality you're all trying to understand. So that's why I'm here. That's why I enjoy our conversations every week. So. Um, I had a week that was quite uh, impacted by the last Sunday, which has happened quite a few times. Um, so we were talking about states and I kind of really went into exploring it, like specifically chasing the theater state, which is kind of this uh, kind of dreamy, very deep into the self kind of thing. And um, realizing how much of a profound impact it's had on my life, but always being quite sort of unreachable, like it, like it would just come and go. Um, and I've always wanted to have it more, more access essentially. So I've kind of been doing quite a lot of that. I've, I've been doing some of that today. So I feel a little bit kind of spaced out and some uh, deep emotional stuff kind of um, bubbling up. And also uh, researching quite a lot of it. It's quite interesting the amount of neuroscience and um, studies and things are, are um, around these days for, for that kind of stuff. So my, my entire week's been kind of tinted by states, really, state training. Hi, I'm Ryan from uh, Portland, Oregon, originally from Hawaii. And um, yeah, my interest is also mostly in just building community and getting to know people and um, bringing people together from all over the world so we can talk to each other. And I, there's just something about that team that's very exciting. And uh, so I've been thinking about, a lot about that lately. And that's why it's a uh, joy to have these calls. Yeah, thank you. There were a few people who said who would come. There were a few people who said they couldn't come. So I think it's uh, 30 minutes after the hour, we just dive into the, into the topic. So I thought now the logical thing would be to continue with the quadrants, which I think personally is a genius um, uh, discovery of, of, of Ken Wilber. So to talk about, uh, do we need it? what is better when we have them, uh, when we consider them, what is maybe worse? Or, so just your take on it. What, what, what do you think about the quadrants without going specifically into one, because that will be later, you know, just the, the whole idea of quadrants. I'll also, also just say that, um, I guess I'm, I'm also keeping time with the stopwatch so that uh, if, what, if it's, um, 30 more seconds, I'll give you a 30 second warning. And then we're going to keep the two minutes to try to encourage follow up questions and clarification, uh, clarifying questions. Ooh, ooh, if I might go first. Um, thank you for, uh, for that, Ryan. Uh, I think um, one of the biggest, uh, well, not revelation so much, but what I really appreciated about Ken Wilber's Four Quadrants so much when I first read about it. Um, when I was 20, well, this was 17 years ago, when I was 25 or so, um, was the fact that he's really honoring both the internal and external and us, you know, we're still living in a pretty much a scientific paradigm. I think we're moving towards more of a quantum paradigm. It's very slow uh, to make that quantum leap, pun intended. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, the fact that he honors both uh, the internal and external and says um, in such a beautiful and articulate and of course integral way that look guys, it's, it's not all about what we can measure externally. It's also about what we can measure internally. And the subjective is just as valid, both in, you know, individually and, and uh, collectively. It's just as valid as the external. Come on people, wake up, Let, let's, let's start to look at um, yeah, both sides more. And I think that was so, so valuable. Uh, and I think the other thing that really inspired me is, um, and he did this in his introduction to the eye of spirit. In the very introduction part, he, it's basically like, like an outline of his, of his theory. He basically uh, pointed out how partial theories kind of bite, bite themselves in their own butt. So if you apply the theory to itself, <laughs> it doesn't work. It's not an integral theory. I thought that was such a neat, beautiful way of, of organizing um, and, and uh, checking if something is integral or not. Yeah. So I want to jump in because you, you, you didn't know, I haven't told you, uh, that in this Sunday call, we try to relate everything a little bit also to our own experience. 
you know. And so uh, I'm coming in and telling you what for me was so important only lately and maybe a year ago when it was the, the, the famous conversation of uh, um, Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris, you know, when I thought so often they are talking about the same thing but they're just coming from two different quadrants. And if they knew that and considered that, they could say, uh, not always, but in, in many ways, no? in many moments, they could save the time for something else, you know? So for me, the, the most important thing with the quadrants is to realize that they are really co-arising, as Ken Wilber says, that they are in the, uh, interdependent. You cannot just have one and ignore the others. And when you have just one, it seems the truth. And then when you see the truth of the other, you think it's something else. No, that, you know, you, when you are able to see from all four perspectives, then you realize, oh, we are not so different <laughs> than we thought before, you know. And for me, it's, that's the big thing. Um, for me, I've quite, I found it quite useful in my business, actually. Like, recently, I've started to do a sort of aqua check. Like, am I hitting um, all the quadrants? Like, um, for years, I've biased the, the upper left to the point of, um, basically, I sell things online. And if I wouldn't, if my products wouldn't sell, I'd sort of blame my, my interiority. Like, obviously, a lot of it is my responsibility because it's my store. But the flavor of it would be, like, I'm lacking creativity or emotional something juice or integrity or something like this, as opposed to like just looking at the the raw ob objectivity of the sales or that actually the upper right is very different to the upper left. And there's loads of uh, data and information that I, I would never know getting into the upper left. Um, and then also like the lower left, kind of comes in very much in, in marketing or appreciating other people's uh, creativity or recently the lower right, like systems thinking, like um, I spoke to Ryan a little bit about um, automation and things like this that's starting to come or you have in the 3D world, you have kind of procedural uh, content creation. And um, I, I, I was actually thinking, I was looking at this thing where you can script basically mouse clicks and keyboard stuff and I got to the point of like I could almost automate all of the really monotonous boring crap that I do um, basically have a computer program do it for me and then completely focus on my creative side so it was kind of um, using the aqua has been has been really powerful actually in even in quite a short span of time Well, um, <laughs> I set my own timer. Um, yeah, this is a this is an interesting thing to me. I remember when I read, uh, I think it was, um, brief history of everything, maybe sexy cult of spirituality. You know, Ken talks about first, second, third person perspective and the good, the true, and the beautiful. And he was saying that in modernity, Immanuel Kant separated the big three. You know, the good, the true, and the beautiful with his three critiques. Um, and then he said, but he didn't integrate the big three. And I never really understood what that meant. What, is it, what did it mean? What does it mean to integrate the good, the true, and the beautiful? Or, or what that would look like. And I think it's, it can be fun to visualize, uh, like, for example, something like science, which has only been traditionally been a, a third person, right hand quadrant discipline, what that would look like if it was integrated with left hand quadrants with subjectivity, beauty, aesthetics, morality, ethics. And so that's kind of how I like to play with the quadrants is thinking about fields that have been traditionally only one quadrant. And then what would it look like the souped up integral version where it would be mixed in with, with other ones. So I'll just throw that in here. Okay, so I don't use the aqua model. Um, so I'm coming from a very different perspective. So I can only really comment on, on some precursory um, observations that I find to be very interesting. And one is it's fourfoldness. And I find it really interesting that it's four and not three. 
um, and that the image itself has some resonance through the different structures of, uh, of Gebser's like archaic magic, mythic, mental. Um, the number four is really interesting. The tet, uh, what is it called? The, um, the tetrad, I think it's called, or, or a tetramorph, or the four, and the significance of four, um, which represents and expresses balance, is very interesting. That, um, well, Gebser, you know, what he says is, you know, in mental consciousness, the thinking is always in threes. It's triadic. It's directive. It's it's sort of the pyramid of thinking that's kind of going forward, but with integrality, we move from the third dimension, which is spatiality, to the fourth dimension, which incorporates time and temporics. Um, so four becomes really important, and the tetramorph becomes really important for integral thinking. So I find it interesting, just as a, as a very, you know, distant observation that um, Aquil is using four, and it's almost like a kind of a mandala of reality. And I think the fourfoldness of the Aquil model, the, the, um, completeness of it, the expression of completeness that it represents is really interesting. And I think that's why for some, to some degree, it's so powerful and it's so kind of orienting, you know? Um, so that's just my, my initial observation. I can get into more stuff too, but I think that's my first note. Just a quick question. Um, I, I'm, I wasn't aware that the the four quadrants were I, I i know the holons are relating with time and you know the holonic movements and the way the holons um develop you develop through transcendence and inclusion but i'm not really clear if someone could clear this up for me how time relates to the four quadrants because time is not actually one of the quadrants <clears throat> as i as far as i understand yeah. it the the time element comes in with the holonic development can can you clarify that a bit um jeremy I wouldn't be able to, but that would be, that's the thing that I didn't mention, which is the critique, um, the, the, the concept that Gebser brings up that is, a, is a, what to look for when looking at integral thinking is temporics. And where is time getting introduced to spatial measurable systems? Are we, are we factoring in time beyond just an abstract concept? Obviously process, becoming, evolution, you know, emergence, time becomes so important. So that's my question. And that's always been kind of my reservation with the aqua model, because for me, it's very static. It's very helpful. But I think the deficient aspect of it is that it doesn't seem to incorporate time so well. That's my question. I, I don't know either. I'm not an aqua expert. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, no, because I, I think for me, the way I understood it, and I don't know about... Um about Ryan, Paul, or Heidi, is that the time aspect in, in the aqual model comes in with development and movement over time and how holons unfold into greater complexity and maybe less span. So the, the more depth something has, the, the less there are of them. Um, it, it, and that happens in terms of paradigms instead of the internal and, up, uh, and external, the subjective and the objective. Um, so this, I think time is, is very much included in, in Wilbur's model in terms of holonic development. And then he talks about how each holon has four existing or four quadrants, um, right down to quarks uh, and right up to universes. They all have four aspects, uh, but they're also, also holons and holons have a tendency to evolve and develop over time and in very particular ways. And that, that's when he talks about transcend, uh, transcendence and inclusion and greater depth and less span and things like that. So I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything in terms of the time yeah. aspect. I want to ask Jeremy, uh, the research of Terry O'Fallon and Kim Barter seems to, to work with that. Uh, are, are you f familiar with that? Just very, very basically. Um, <laughs> I, I've, I've done some research. Uh, me and a few Gepsarians have been asking about how they worked Gepser structures into the model. And we had some disagreements about that, but overall it seems to be much more dynamic expression. Um, that's the impression I get with Terry O'Fallon's work especially. It seems to be very, um, uh, the time factor is very much present there and I think that's good. So, uh, but uh, that, that's just me as an outsider again, kind of just reading it for the first time recently, so. So, so Jeremy, so Kinga gave an example of how 
to her, time is this this factor of time is included in in the integral model as it's currently presented by Wilbur. So my guess, my question to you is like, a, and correct me if I'm wrong. A, why would that be inadequate for you, in terms of in terms of not really taking time fully into consideration? And B, how would you personally amend it or depict this element of time, to enhance the Apple model to your to your liking? Uh, well, okay, so the reason why it's not fully adequate is um, it's still a very mental conception of time according to stages and striations. And um, it, there's, a, there's an ascent, there's a directivity towards it. It's not really encompassing the mythical form of time or the magical form of time um, or the immeasurable aspects of time. So it's not really able to include those dimensionalities because it's very much kind of orienting itself towards these steps or stages. So it's just a very mental expression of time, which tends to be more abstract and distinctive and sort of Cartesian in that sense. It, it spatializes time by creating, um, making time into objects almost like a block. You know, here is the magical stage and then the mythical stage is on top of that and then the me mental. And you, you can have some abstract appreciation of time in that when you can say, okay, we move through these stages of development, but it's a very kind of a mechanical expression of something that needs to be expressed also, also organically. Gepser wouldn't say mental time is not a form of time. It's just that it's one aspect of it. It's the three-dimensional spatial and abstract expression of time. So he's saying time is more than even that and we need to figure out how to express it in our, in our systems. But it's the beginning of it. I think it's sort of the beginning of trying to explore these things that, that Gepser talks about. It's, it's trying to figure out how to move from in Gepser's terminology, synthesis to cystasis. And cystasis is that kind of introduction of temporics into spatial systems. And it first shows up in this kind of abstract form of time, chronological time, segmented time. Um, and it's fine, but it's just not entirely what Gepser's kind of leaning us into, you know, so. Right, right. I, I guess I guess what comes up for me when I hear this is it, it sounds almost to a degree kind of like a map versus territory issue where I think the time that Gebser describes this diaphanous kind of flow where the future is now is almost impossible to depict linearly on a map or in a book, right? I mean, how do you, how does one even get to try describing that without actually having some kind of a direct experience of that? So in, in some sense, I think, wouldn't it be kind of almost impossible to do that adequately using rational logic or diagrams like Wilbur uses to depict these abstract concepts? Because that would be, so in reality, in the territory, perhaps the time would be experienced at that, but we need a map to at least even Illum illuminate the possibility of a territory, right? Uh, I, I don't think, no, I think our maps express our territories. I think our maps express our consciousness and um, our maps can evolve. Uh, actually, I do think that we owe it to ourselves to experiment with trying to find new language and new expression. And, and the fact that all of the structures seem to have their own maps, their own forms of language, their own forms of expression that are stylistic that are characteristic of their structure, to me is like, well, then the integral needs a new form of expression and language too. And I think it's happening. You know, I think temporics is being introduced anyway into, into our styles of thinking. So um, I think there's a lot of good examples too, just maybe not so much in, in transpersonal psychology and the integral movement exactly, but um, you know, it's beginning to be expressed in literature and in, in other spaces. So I think it's possible. I think we should try. Mm. I really like what you said, uh, Jeremy, about, um, yeah, that our reality lives in our maps. I think I really agree with that. And I think language is, um, the, you know, a symbol for us uh, defining, but also expressing our reality. And we, we sometimes get, uh, we think it's uh, that our language is reality. You know, we, we collapse the, the subjective with the objective a lot. Um, people think that what they label things is what the thing is. We lose the mystery of things in, in a sense through language. And so having better maps, more inclusive maps, more integral maps is so essential to us experiencing life and living in, in that reality because, because that, the maps do define our reality and I really do believe that to a large extent. Um, cognitively, of course, there's also the experiential and the emotional and the mystic that you've touched on. But I've never heard of Gebser before you mentioned him today and I'm surprised. But um, 
I, I, can you talk a little bit more about Gepps's conception of time um, in different ways? Because I, I, I sense that he might have uh, broached the issue from very multiple perspectives and different, like you, you mentioned the mythic and the mm -hmm. mm, maybe rational there as well. So what, what's Gepser? Tell me more about time and Gepser. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, really, really short. Uh, Gepser, you know, obviously, okay, so you you're familiar with Wilbur, so you know, archaic, magic, mythic, mental, rational, integral. That's Gepser's terminology that he adapted. Um, and Gepser was writing all this back in the 40s. Um, so, so he was one of these early integral thinkers, sort of a contemporary of Sri Aurobindo and Tehard de Chardin and that kind of way, that generation. But um, Gepser's approach is really um, kind of phenomenological and it's always a study of our experience of being in space and time and how we understand and process and perceive space and time. So all of the structures um, are, 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 just, are trying to be descriptive of that. So the archaic is difficult to explain. It's kind of like the origin point. So this doesn't, doesn't exactly count as like a, a culture we can look at. So that's zero dimensional. Um, the magic is one dimensional and that's kind of like a, like a, one point is equal to all other points that space and time are kind of collapsed in the moment in the now and that's very kind of a magical orientation that everything's kind of entangled with everything else the mythic is is more about polarity and rhythmicity the experience of rhythm and movement in nature and cycles and and more kind of psychic processes like in the psyche and the unconscious and like you know um, death and birth winter and summer and those kinds of polarities and energies. Um, the mental kind of breaks out of that and has like a directed spatial orientation. So it experiences time as always going forward and as, a, as almost more like an object than necessarily um, a qualitative intensity. It's kind of an abstraction because we start to learn to think, you know, and time becomes um, directed with the will and we start to move and then we develop the ego and we feel like an ego in space for the first time, you know, and then the, the integral is kind of um, a break out of all of that is kind of the sort of diaphany for him. So it's a kind of um, a multi-dimensionality that enfolds all of these different time forms in, in a present, in the presence, which isn't just a collapse now, flat now, it's a sort of multi-dimensional now. So that's, that's a, the quickest I've tried to sum it up. Um, so he's, his question is always a question of time. How are we experiencing it? And so when we're talking about like maps and mental time, we're like, okay, well, if, we're, if we have a territory and we have a map, how do we experience this kind of multidimensional time in the map? Well, it's because the map is trying to use mental spatial time. It's going, okay, um, here's a Cartesian grid. We're going to divide reality up into these abstract segments. Um, it's not really like that. But then we start to kind of live in that. And that's okay because that's, the men that's what mental is really good at. It's really good at cutting up reality and dividing it abstractly and, and separating the self and creating these distinctions. But it's only one expression. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> Sorry, going on. So, so if I can just ask, oh, go ahead, Heidi. Uh, I wanted to say what we are normally understanding by map is something flat. And you are talking about much many more uh, dimensions, and so maybe we should even call it differently when we when we want to, you know, to talk about this sort of map. <laughs> a model, maybe a model can be three dimensional. Well, maybe better. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ryan. Oh, just a follow-up question for Jeremy, so I understand this, the the correlation between time and. Um, these different structures that Gepser was talking about. So if I went to a person who, like, let's say I went to the Amazonian rainforest, okay, where I, I was talking to, or I even went back in time to the Stone Age, whatever, and talked to people who were in an archaic or magic uh, state of consciousness, whatever you call it, at, the, at that stage. And I interviewed them and, sa and basically said, so how do you experience time, sir? Would they say, would they describe it subjectively as how Gepser is describing? Or am I, is that kind of not right, the right understanding of what you're saying? Yeah, they might. Um, they may be. There might be some difficulty in translating. Like, what do you mean by time? You know, they may have a different word for it, which may be, comp which may actually speak to what Kepler's talking about. They might say, I, "I'm sorry, I don't have any concrete examples for you," but they might say, "Like, oh, our, what you mean by time? We mean by you know, um, 
the gods creating everything or the spirits kind of relating that i don't know they might have this kind of all-encompassing expression for it or or a metaphor for it a very embodied kind of dynamic kind of description of it and yeah i think they might i think they might um what gebser did with like his own approach was really kind of like focus on, on works of art and try to like what is this work of art from the paleolithic saying about you know the perception of the people who created it and sure you know to some degree you might project into that um but that's that's the difficulty with any of this this topic right is try to imagine what another consciousness is like so anyway just i think i think they would i think they would to some degree yeah so what um now we are again with uh, levels of development we wanted to talk about quadrants but for me it's still a little bit uh, enigmatic how the development which is there with skepsis turn terms to how that would happen you say okay river is clearly orange let's say going uh, 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 with linear time and is uh, seeing his theory in a very orange way, you know, and presenting it in a very orange way. So um, how can that be differently? I, I don't think it's necessarily, I don't think Ken Willow is necessarily linear. I think, um, well, from, from you know, my perspective of it, um, the sense of, I keep going back to time being tied to holons and unfolding because how else can you measure time unless there are changes? And there, there this idea of change, which always happens in the now moment, and we never know, we do, uh, from our perspective, we only ever have um, uh, our, the perception of the moment, and because of our brain systems, we've got memories of the past, but in, in, in essence, we only ever have this now moment, and, and a memory of the past, but we can't foresee the future being the way we are made in these body systems. So this idea of holons unfolding in the moment, um, and we never know what is next after teal, what is more integral in terms of paradigms and perspective. We don't know what is next in, in, you know, in terms of after integral uh, in these developmental lines, and these are different aspects of holons. Um, the only thing we can really know is what we've got a memory of uh, in, within our own lives, as well as through history books or whatever, in terms of the greater unfoldment, um, but yes, yeah, so it doesn't, it's not necessarily linear because Holands are unfolding in the moment and they're always a becoming and they've always, uh, they've also got to have been or being, but in the moment they just are what they are. And I think Wilbur would very much acknowledge you can just see, well, what, what is my, the whole on of my, uh, I, uh, my personal being right now, me being a body, mind, spirit system. Uh, this is how I'm showing up in this moment. I have been, uh, and I remember being other, uh, other ways in the past. I've only got access through that, through my memories though. But there is, there is a sense of, uh, yeah, you can look at it through the memory of time and how it's unfolded until now, which is of course all, always still ever interpreted from the present. So there's a present bias of reinterpreting. Um, so there is, yeah, I mean, you can think of it like a line, but in the end, it's just the ever present now moment for me. Interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think the, the difficulties come up just in, in terms of um, utilizing a stage model uh, in that very often the previous levels of your whole line, let's say your eight year old self or something, you know, like that works better, I think, in individual psychology. But when we start talking about the evolution of human societies overall and we kind of say well this person's really at that kind of amber level or blue level or whatever language we're using um we start to kind of distance ourselves from that and we even kind of imagine ourselves on this sort of line or trajectory of emergence where we're kind of over here somewhere and like that was earlier and and there's an acceptance of the earlier but insofar as there's a kind of like, well, they're at where they're at and they need to grow through it. You know, there's a very kind of patting on the back um, attitude. And I know that not necessarily a, trying to be, to be consciously expressed in the theory. I think there's a lot of sort of, you know, theoretically we're not supposed to be doing that. But I think spate, the, the very employment of, of spatial um, uh, temporics 
that sort of perspectival thinking kind of create sets us up to have these feelings of kind of being higher or lower, you know, above something or beyond something. And I think that that starts to create problems because, um, as you're saying, you know, being present in the moment and imminent to the moment, all of your past is with you, right? So, um, anyway, I, I think distancing ourselves from the past uh, is is a is a result of perspectival this new perspectival consciousness, and it's great and it's helpful sometimes, but it's also it also trips us up from actually accessing the past and the actual previous structures. This is interesting. Uh, I, I should go back to the, to, to the quadrants, but I still wanted to share that when you do some sort of hypnotherapy, Paul, you probably know that, then um, the time, future and past and present times, they are not really so much distant anymore. And so this line which we think from the past, we are going through the present into the, into the future seems to, to disappear. Um, just to throw that in, but maybe we come to the quadrants in a while. <laughs> I think we got kind of sidelined because of the, con the, the question of time, which is such a good question, where maybe we can kind of come back to that. Where is the time, where does time show up in the aqua model itself? I know you're talking about holons, um, but is, is time kind of included in, in aqua as a, as a framework itself? I, I don't know. Um, I was going to say, like, what I hear a lot of is, like, upper left in the Gebson. I'm not sure if this is true or not, but the the experience of time and how it can be different. So, like, Heidi mentioned orange, and you mentioned, like, archaic and, like, magic and mythic and all this kind of stuff. And how, uh, which I guess is a stages kind of topic. Um that's that's how it comes to me. I get the impression that that's it, it would probably be different in the map you, you're saying. Um, but I kind of appreciate anyway the the different takes on time or the different what I would say upper left experience of it. And um, yeah, Heidi mentioning the hypnotherapy thing. That's something I think I've been wrestling with. Of I think that's possibly a quality of the subtle body, which you could argue is in quite a few stages and stuff where. It does feel like the, the present, the past, and the future are kind of condensed in this like very strange way. I mentioned about going to this Catholic cathedral, um, or not Catholic, just this big cathedral, and having a very strong energetic presence in the moment of energy that was clearly like coming from the past was kind of weird. Um, and also sometimes having the subtle body impression of things from the future is also pretty weird. But... Um, I sort of had that experience enough to, and I wonder if some of that is maybe what Gebser is is getting at, or uh, maybe you could clarify something. Hmm. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because uh, with with the upper left uh, observation there, I think it's it. Yeah, it would appear to be that way in terms of like where are we within this model? Where are we talking about? Or what are we talking about? Where does it fit? in the model, where is it being described? And it's certainly upper left, um, but then it doesn't quite fit into the upper left. I think because around the edges of each of these claims, what we're really saying is there's a world here, right? That it would be, if we were to take the aqua model and kind of rephrase it a little bit, it would be archaic, magic, mythic, mental. And I don't know how we would fit that in, right? But, um, or w which side they would go on or anything. But in terms of the fourfold model, Gebser has that himself, you know? Um, and okay, there is a fifth, the integral, but that's sort of the whole, right? It's kind of the, the, the whole kind of presentiating itself. Um, so it, Gebser talks a lot about this fourfoldness, which is interesting. And these kind of come up, these, these are questions not only of upper left perception, but also kind of ontology, you know, like, the two-dimensional world, the unperspectival world, which is the magical and the mythic, right? That kind of the flatness, the participation, the psychistic world, the reality where subject and object are not distinguished quite yet, like they are in the kind of Cartesian split. What if that's a whole world in itself, you know? So 
a lot of these questions I don't really have answers for. I, I, I think it, you know the, uh, I'm more of interested in the processes of how we change back and forth from that. And now we seem, seem to be very kind of Cartesian, right? In, and at any rate, so so yeah, I, I don't know. Um, that was the first comment. The second comment I'll, I'll, I'll hold off on. I've got to go in a second, but one last perspective. Um, I'm starting to get some clarity, I think, around maybe how time, how else could time could fit into Wilbur's. In having spoken about, you know, memories of our past, you know, I think um, Kil uh, Wilbur also points out um, that the memories that we have, uh, for example, when I was a child, I probably had a very different sense of time than I do as an adult. And I don't actually have access to that sense of time anymore. I have access to the memory of being a child, but to that actual direct access of time, it's different. So different perspectives on time are perhaps possible through the upper left, which is the subject, the individual subjective as we evolve. And I might have a very different perception of time in my older age when I'm 80 and perhaps closer to physical death or just the moment before I die. So there's so many different perspectives of individual it can have throughout the course of their lives. Um, having also touched on the Amazonian cultures, I think there's also different cultural um, um, accesses to time that might be radically different to ours that we can't even conceive of. For example, uh, having grown up in Australia, the Australian Aborigines have what they call um, this realm, which I don't fully understand, called the dream time. And the dream time is basically like a spiritual realm I can't even start to describe it, but I think they have a very radical different concept of time that we don't have access to in the West. And that to them is radically different to linear Cartesian time. So that brings in different perspectives of time in the upper left and lower left uh, individual and cultural quadrants. Um, so I, yeah, that might be something to play with. So in the end, quickly concluding, I don't know if uh, Ken really leaves time out of it. I think he gave us a map. And he said, these are the aspects you can't deny. The way you fill in the details is up to you. And that's the beauty of his generalist model. I don't think it leaves time out. I think it le leaves it up to us to decide which cultural, which developmental individual, uh, how that all fits together. Yeah. And now I've got to go, lovely people, and I hate to go, uh, but I'll hopefully see you next Sunday. Thank you so much for having me. Lovely to have met you, connected with you. It really fills my heart. And uh, see you again next Sunday. I, hopefully I can stay the whole time, but I really need to um, yeah, go with other commitments I've made prior. Thank you again. Take care. Nice to meet you. Bye. See you again. I had a thought which was, I'm not sure this is related or not, but in relation to like the, the quadrants cat, like um, aren't always like perfectly split up and sometimes it's like confusing how they they map on each other like i was thinking i'm not really sure if this is a bit random but i remember reading this book about herbs and it was an upper left um description of the way certain herbs would would impact you and he was relaying it at the time to um for example he was talking about coffee sugar and tea and relating that to basically the sort of orange industrialization and it was kind of this fascinating like qu um cross quadrant uh thing of like talking about how um jeremy you're talking about like the way that that time really becomes a thing in kind of orange or, or something did and the way that like coffee uh, as a kind of stimulant and um allowing for more energy allowing for more industry and also to some extent like in the sense of increasing the the energy of the body sort of increases the sense of time like time is now we need to really maximize um our productivity as it were so i'm not sure i guess that's kind of some of my point is as i was reading this book it was like this really interesting meld of the different quadrants um in a way i'd never really heard before and it's sort of interesting the way sometimes you can have a really defined sense of a quadrant like oh this is upper right and then other times you can be this is upper left and then to see the the interaction between the two and at times when they uh they seem to blend and merge in a way that's kind of um it's sort of interesting how it can be ambiguous how they impact each other at times yeah i, I really never find um just just having worked a little bit with Wilbur's model over the years. I, I've never found, you know, exclusive upper left or exclusive lower left or, or 
bottom right. I mean, and even in the postmodern turn, you know, it's like, it's that insight that, you know, you could see the whole right hand quadrants, upper right and lower right as the mental perspectival world. It's, it's the measurable, spatial, tangible reality that's empirically viewed, you know, the exteriors. Um, that distinction is a very, you know, Renaissance era kind of distinction, really. I mean, you could trace it back to Aristotle and maybe his empiricism, but, um, you know, this is something that's really only come online recently. So uh, they're always talking to each other. They always, and, and maybe that's the point with Wilbur's model is that you always, they're always kind of in relation. Um, so to, to his credit, I think that's, that could be very insightful. But um, yeah, I've just never seen it. Uh, a unique isolated quadrant in, in the wild that's always kind of wrapped up in something. And, and um, a lot of scholarship is really good at that, I think, um, at least contemporary scholarship. Yeah, and I think the misunderstandings come when somebody tries to limit what they are doing or what they are on one quadrant, you know, then uh, like science did for a long time. And what uh, new age people do when they think it's only the internal is important and the rest is not important. So I think what Paul said before, with the quadrants, you have sort of a checklist where to look. What do you habitually overlook in your life? And I do overlook the lower right often, you know. And uh, I love the upper right and I love the uh, upper left. And I do like, and it's also what we are trying to do here, the lower left, but the lower right institutions and things and rule systems and all that that's mm, mm. but that's my personal let's say inclination but it's a reminder that they are there too and that to become more whole i have to take care that i don't leave out something and that's for me the 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 merit of the aqua model and i think with Weber's statement that they are all tetra arising that there cannot be one without the other even if we pretend that, <laughs> that they be focused only on one and the others don't exist. Uh, I think um, that's what, what you say. You never see really only one quadrant and uh, the others not. They, they are there, even if sometimes you see them a little less clearly, but they are. And so it's a map to for reminders that's not only the upper left or it's not only the upper right and not only system theory which can resolve everything which we want to to <laughs> to resolve i i'll go on Ryan. Oh, no go ahead paul um i was just thinking in some ways how i wouldn't exactly say it was easy but in some ways it is kind of easy taking it out into the world of like people that are really disciplined in one area like you're saying Heidi like doing it on ourselves is a really great practice but you can do that on all the kind of world's knowledge which often is bickering over uh, one quadrant or another like you mentioned um, Jordan Peterson versus uh, Sam Harris where they're basically just endlessly headbutting over upper left and upper right and um, you kind of see that in, in the other spheres as well like I always thought if I ever end up going in therapy or something, which is obviously very sort of upper left, it'd be quite easy to put some upper right stuff. Or, for example, when you, if you take, um, there's a lot of like drugs peddling in sort of orange, kind of like let's medicate it away. Um, and then in therapy, you have the sort of upper left. And like just combining those two alone would be pretty powerful, like having physical health and having mental health actually be uh, united. And that's just like two disciplines. Um, I think I guess that takes quite a lot in the sense of when you're actually rigorous and you're actually dealing with those disciplines you actually go quite deep but the basic idea is quite simple like if you can just see a, a discipline in one area and then just try to hybridize it or try to uh, introduce it to another one can be can be pretty powerful I think I think there are attempts, if I've understood you right, what you mean, there are attempts to do that functional medicine, for instance, integrative medicine, which not necessarily have uh, the Wilbur model, but there are uh, attempts to, to see it from, from the exteriors and the interiors and, and even include uh, the, the lower 
quadrants, so the community aspects and also the systems aspect. No? When you think, think about the influence of, of hospitals on your uh, uh, resolving an illness and hospitals where they wake you up at three o'clock in the morning and uh, disturb your sleep, so how can you heal? So <laughs> that's all all connected, you know, and we can, we need to really, to, to come to a different health system or health, um, how do you say, concept, as you say, Paul, no? uh, we need to really see it from all these perspectives. A person who is completely alone, has no community and is ill, has so much more difficult to difficulty to heal and there are already researches on all these things so we know it already it's only we need to take steps to to combine all these areas and some courageous people are doing it and i'm grateful for that i don't know how it would be with the gapser model i think there the quadrants model gives really an indication where where to go and where to connect things Uh, yeah, I don't, um, I'm not really sure uh, how, to, how to come at that directly, but um, the, it, with Gepser structures, I mean, it, it's it's really, really more about understanding the process in which our consciousness has transformed and, and the presence of those structures that are still in us, still enacted in the world, uh, even if they're enacted in an unhealthy way or uh, repressed way. So it's, it's really a kind of an integrating process. Um, cat's trying to get into the bedroom. Um, it's really a kind of an integrating process. And again, the temporics is the, is the highlight, the process, the, the opening up to the dynamics and the energies. And as one of my colleagues has mentioned, uh, one of the missing elements from Akul might be uh, uh, temporics in the form of I, thou, we have I, we, and it's, but where's the thou? Where's the other, the other, the other who's looking back at us? And it's that I, thou, and that dynamism between the other, which seems to be, yeah, it could fit into the we, like the collective we, but that's still, it's still an identity. We're still, there's no distinction. There's a distinction, but there's still a, um, a mingling between the two. And so I guess the critique would be there's still a kind of a subtle Cartesianism. Um, it's a kind of a, a, a very integral model of I, um, we, it, or subject, object um, spaces, but where's the thou in all of this? And I think that kind of opening up to the other might be the missing element here. Um, or at least this is how I'm understanding one of my colleagues' critiques here. I, I shared a link in the, in the chat. There's a couple versions of it. Um, He's not, you know, he's not one of those Wilbur hater guys, but he's, um, he's, he's just a Gibsarian trying to bring in some of his two cents. So I think the missing thou is sort of interesting here. I have another question to that because Wilbur uh, was using Gebsa to develop his theory. So the question I'm asking now is what is missing with Gebsa, which Wilbur has? Ooh, good question. I don't know if there's anything, um, but the Gebser's not trying to do the the a totalizing theory. Um, what's missing uh, is Wilbur's more contemporary. He he has so much more access to decades of new thinkers and scholars. Um, Gebser died in 1973, uh, so he really missed the whole human potential movement and 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 the wonderful developments in transpersonal psychology and human human development. So I think all of those things would, you know, if the style of thinking that Gebser's talking about, which hasn't really been picked up on from his passing, not in an explicit way by the integral thinkers, um, I think there's a lot of potential going forward. I don't know if Wilbur's has something specific, but I think the focus on human potential um, in, in bringing that with Gepser would be really cool. Really, really cool. Um, and really kind of exciting just to think about. So, so yeah. Um, I kind of see Wilbur as one of these, like, you know, Gepser himself would say about his own work, um, one of these interim thinkers who's, you know, uh, like, like in that article I shared, you know, the, the new consciousness is not just going to spring up 
fully formed. We've already worked everything out. Here it is. Here's the model. Here's all, here's the new reality. We got it. Um, we're going we're, we're interim beings. We're kind of, um, between the perspectival and the aperspectival. So I think Wilbur is a good expression of, you know, he's a brilliant guy. He's trying to in introduce temporics and, and he ha he's integrally oriented and he ha wants to create this model of reality, but he's doing it in a really kind of a spatial perspectival way still. Um, and I don't think he's really aware of it because he's employing it and not really describing it as he's employing it. Gepster's always kind of going, all right, I'm going to employ it now. Let's use a static spatial model and, and we know we're using it. This isn't good enough. I don't know. So I think the openness for me is in the future and whoever's going to start doing this today and kind of bringing these guys together today. So. Is that Kate? I think it's Kate. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Hi. hi, Kate. Hi. So you have missed a little bit the discussion. We we didn't really stay with the with the quadrants all the time. We went into te temporics and 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 many other aspects. Also because there was a new person and. Jeremy gave us a good, I think, a good short outline of, of the gaps I thought, you know. Oh, I'm an hour late. Oh, brother. Okay, yeah. sorry. And now we try to come back to, to, to the quadrants. And my last question to Jeremy was, what, because he said something is missing with Wilma, Wilbur before and explained it. And uh, I said, uh, what is missing with Gapsa? And he was saying mainly that... Uh, he missed out the development from the 70s to today. So that's definitely missing and that we are in a sort of interim stage and he's looking forward to people who bring these things sort of together, no? or, or further develop them uh, with, a, with what we have uh, now and what will come in the future. Is that okay, Jeremy? Yeah, that's perfect, thanks. <laughs> So Kate, up to you, your, your ideas on, on the usefulness or not usefulness or missing or overdoing or whatever of, of quadrants. You need to unmute yourself. Sorry, I'm time confused. I thought it started now. Um, oh boy, I don't know. Uh, uh, the usefulness of quadrants? <laughs> Well, I found it, you know, I built a curriculum for prisons on the four quadrants, so I, I obviously find it useful, but in the implication, it's a little more difficult. Let's just say that. You have to throw out the lower right, pretty much, unless you want to just talk about family systems, and it really has to be simplified, you know, I mean, in my opinion, and... Um, But you know, it's it's just there's so much in the in these three quadrants, and then this, of course, they're in an institution, so that's impacting the whole thing. It impacts the subjective, the behavioral, the culture of prisons is pretty dramatically different. So, I, I but then again, I don't know. I'm kind of like at a loss because I, I have this class now that's really difficult. And they're, they're in such a high state of suffering that it's about all I could do on Friday was go to some behavioral. This one girl was saying she's like wanting to scratch her face off. That's all she can do. She so feels so trapped with nothing to do. So she sits there scratching her face off all day. And she says, I can't even do anything like look at breath or look at anything or think about anything because I just you know it's a, it's pretty and she this, she she hasn't been like this before but is this is a result of months and months of this being in a state where they don't have anything to do all day long they have they don't even let them watch tv they don't give them books there, there's nothing to do there's a couple of classes they can go to they um let them watch tv maybe at five o'clock so they sit around with each other all day and get in big fights that's what it sounds like happens. So, <laughs> so that's definitely. I get all excited about these theories, but then when you get in there, it's like, oh boy. 
definitely lower right, right shortcomings, no? What? There is definitely lower right shortcomings. The institution which is not appropriate to, it's not life fostering, but sort of destroying. Uh, yeah, it's having a really, it has, it's like way imbalanced in the influence it's having on their state of mind. And, you know, I mean, I think they already came in with a pretty rough state of mind. And the behaviors obviously landed them there. there was, so. uh, excuse me come from cultures they were telling me about you know it's mother's day and they're all mothers of four or five kids they're 26 and 27 years old or 30 with five kids the kids are all in foster care now and the whole thing is just kind of oof. so yeah i had some high aspirations with integral but <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes just sitting there listening. And, um, you know, they do remember straw breath. That's one thing I've given them, but that's just like a momentary state shift that calms them down in the moment, which of course can save their lives. So sometimes state shifts can save your life. I uh, just uh, listened a little bit to Jess Sausman talking with a person who who got into contact with the books of Ken Wilber in present. So it seems to be uh, different how how the institutions work. <laughs> Some people can <laughs> get <laughs> that guy is my work partner. He's a, he's the one that founded this organization I run. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> um. So I, I guess I have another question, kind of going off what Kate just said, back back to Jeremy, um, and and I I was going to propose that Jeremy, me and you did a crossfire sometime, uh, but I'll just ask. So this is a question I was saving for maybe one of our future crossfires. But what the hell, I'll just ask you now. So like Kate, Kate is describing like these situations where it's like you know really intense and really hard. The people just really you know been through a whole bunch of shit in their life and. I'm kind of curious how, if at, if at all, Gebser's model or insight could help someone who's really struggling, you know, like that in, in a prison setting or like, you know, I started working for the Department of Human Services doing note taking for family decision meetings with families who are, kids are getting, um, you know, taken away and they're, they're meeting with the, the caseworkers and the lawyers to see if they can get the kid back and what kind of plan do you have to have. And I saw a lot of spiral dynamics there at play that kind of irked me and I kind of wanted to be the facilitator or the caseworker because I wasn't happy with the way they were leading the meeting and I guess my question is like what can I by understanding time in this way and subjectivity is there any insight that could be practically translated to helping people like that yeah um so maybe we can make a distinction too maybe one of the things that might be omitted from Gebser's approach because of that lack of uh, uh, integrating the Maslow era of, of hierarchy of needs and existential needs that sort of um, Claire Graves developed spiral dynamics through um, sort of existential levels. Uh, maybe that's not looked at so much in Gebser. It's more of a kind of a, a, a very beautiful overview of human consciousness and a kind of a spiritual orientation towards the world and even a contemplative practice of presencing. So if those things insofar as they can help um, make a better society and a, and a more present individual, um, then yeah, that would be great. But I don't know if that would work, you know, if we're in a situation like that, okay, here's this person in this life world dealing with these existential problems because of class and race and all those things that kind of get wrapped up in those dynamics. Um, I don't know if Gebser would really, he's not as kind of utilitarian in that sense. Um, you know, it, it's like reading, I don't know, Aurobindo's work or Tehard's work. It, it, it can transform you, but I don't know if it works necessarily in, you know, a clinical setting directly like that, you know, a tool that you can go and apply. And I don't think it's meant to be that either um, as a model. But that being said, you know, just the overall view of being conscious of these structures in ourselves, I think somebody who has a mind for that could do quite, quite a lot of great work in terms of contemplative practices and working with an individual to help them heal. I think actually in psychotherapy, this would be really exciting to see if we had more people working 
in uh, with the structures um, for developing certain practices or 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 concretions of the structures, as we would say. So um, I think there's a possibility there. I think I don't know if I'm the right person to to do, to develop the, those particular models because that's the application aspect of it. Um, I'm just kind of holding the 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 understanding and expression and hoping to connect with people who are willing to do that. So. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that really directly answers the question, but I think there's a there's a different style in these in Gepser's model and expression, and then taking that into questions of class and society, etc. Um, it might help you get the understanding structures that are at work and the whole dynamics of that society and why that individual might be sick, you know, or dealing with something, some kind of social and spiritual stress. I think it is very good at doing that kind of like Hillman's uh, therapy and, and his psychology, but I don't know if it would, I don't know if it could be mass produced exactly. I think it's sort of case by case. Great, well, thank that, you. Thank you, Jeremy. That would be the inter integral view of, you know, tailoring the situation, but when you're in a group dynamic in these classes, all you have, all the people really have available as groups. They don't really have individual therapies. They have maybe five minutes with a caseworker or something asking them if they are ready for their release plan or something, you know, or they, do they have a job and they don't. And so I know Guy, du, what's his name? Guy Duplessis or something. Do you know him? He's an integral person, I guess. And he developed a, a model for integral approach to addictions. But again, it's very, it's a very good book. It's like really in depth on and on and on about all the conceptual chaos in addictions therapy, just addictions as a, as a um, on the ground issue. But he kind of replaces the spiritual, he narrowed it down to just six dimensions that could be worked on, you know, behavioral, cognitive, blah, blah, six. But he replaced, um, he didn't like, he doesn't like this developmental levels, you know, which I actually find helpful that, that you can actually move more um have some better moves in there if you just can change your language you know it, it, when you see something in, it, alive in somebody not to just start talking like talk like oh your authentic self with a genuine you know this kind of weird green meme kind of talking to people and so um he replaced the spiritual with the existential because he's really into heidegger you know being and doing and all that stuff and and i was like oh boy you know like <laughs> I'm not so sure of that for the lower means because the spirituality actually gives people a structure that they can plug into, like even in a prison, you know, they find Jesus, a lot of people find Jesus and all that kind of stuff. Like you can actually plug into something, but plugging into existentialism while you're, <laughs> that seems a little, it doesn't allow for the community structures, you know, spirituality will give you like, services and things that you can do and get together with community meetings, charity work, singing, all kinds of stuff. I don't know about existentialists sitting around singing together and, you know, unless <laughs> they're drunk. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I got what he was trying to do. He was trying to make it more open, but I think existentialism would be sort of open to the higher levels of development that, you know, contemplations on Heidegger. I mean, I can't even imagine going and talking about being and doing and time and all that stuff. And they'd just be like, what? <laughs> what else you got for me? You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so a couple, a couple thoughts. I mean, Kate, I think one of the helpful things that I noticed was what really bothered me at some of these case meetings that I went to was that these lawyers and caseworkers who definitely were very like orange and very mental and rational and they had a subtle expectation that the guy that they're talking to, who was the father whose child was taken away, he was Mexican and um, didn't speak a lot of English. You know, his mom was probably from Mexico. And a lot of his behavioral problems that were described in the meeting were very red, like a lot of problems with impulse control. And uh, he gets into spontaneous fights with his brother and probably some drug and alcohol problems too. And they were, and these lawyers and caseworkers, these well-educated upper middle-class people were lecturing him as if he should be orange. And if he's not acting like an orange person, like in a middle class society, then there's something wrong with him. And it was very condescending and, and in my opinion, very unhelpful. And I could, I could literally see like the memes of orange and red, like clashing in the room. And I was just like, oh man, like put me in there, you know? Um, and I just had to keep quiet and take notes for the whole thing. 
But um, the the thing that to me is, I mean, even just knowing integral, like and, and knowing like you don't have that expectation that people should be like you. If only everyone was like me, then the world would be a better place, you know. Um, so I think I think that's one thing that's really helpful. The other thing I think that's really helpful about the quadrants is you understand like cause that, like what is ca like the root of the cause of something from a quadrant. So for example, I, I remember one night I woke up with a horrible anxiety attack at about two in the morning and it felt really like, a, I, I don't usually have anxiety attacks. So this was really strange. And um, it happened again to me. And I realized that the cause of my anxiety attack was because I'm allergic to tempeh. I'm allergic to soy products. And I ate tempeh and like something before bed. And so the cause of the, anxiety attack was from a lower uh, upper right quadrant physical thing in my brain but it registered in my upper left quadrant experience as an anxiety attack but because i knew that it was from tempe i could stop eating soy products i never got anxiety attacks ever again and when i did have an anxiety attack i knew that it was from tempe so i didn't need to worry so that's one thing that's one way quadrants are really helpful for me Yeah, um, just interesting stories though about uh, the dynamics of of being there with the red and the and the, the orange is, is interesting. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, spiral dynamics, especially, it, it really is. I don't really have a problem with with those memes as they're kind of enacted in our culture. I think it's true, you know, to some to some degree. Um, I, I just have a problem when they're in kind of inflated to the evolution of human consciousness. I think they have more to do with the life conditions of the perspectival mental oriented modern civilization with prison systems and the economic system the way it is and class systems the way they are than they do with our the actual evolution of human consciousness and that's my that's my real problem you know I think they're more of they're in the stage theater of the perspectival world and I think using the spiral dynamics in that model is much more helpful than projecting it into deep time. Does, if that makes, does that make sense? Yeah. Do you view it as a growth model or a development model then? Because then you, yeah. you can, but if you, I mean, that's reaching on, I mean, just like, it does seem like you're able to hold more complexity. Maybe I'm not convinced of that from the green memes <laughs> lately. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's always growth. Um, yeah. I, I, if, if we're seeing it again as sort of a Maslowian hierarchy of needs where like, okay, if you have subsistence problems, you're going to be more red oriented and more like got to take what you need and survive and be more aggressive because that's just what your life conditions. Um, maybe to some degree, there's like a little bit of that. But once you get up to, you know, okayness existentially you know subsistence levels are okay i don't know if it works anymore you know i don't know like you're saying with green because that's a very kind of late stage thing according to the model and yet it seems to be exhibiting very orange problems which is the perspectival cutting up and nobody's able to talk with everybody it's all about me or my own subjective expression um you know that that's for perspectival problem according to, to Gepser's model. So uh, to me, again, it's like it's contained within the perspectival world and maybe it's about growth and, and health, you know, like a health, healthy localized culture that isn't worrying about, you know, economic problems and subsistence that can kind of self-actualize a little bit and develop cultural norms with blue and maybe a little bit edgy orange, you know, like maybe a little bit, but I, I just don't think it's totalizing the way we project it, you know, like, I like listening to uh, Fred Leloux's talks about, you know, decentralization and new, new organizations and everything. But then when he's giving this sort of history of human societies and talking about early red and it doesn't, it falls apart with what we know about anthropology and, and, and consciousness studies anyway. Um, so again, I think it's more, it's more localized than we're, than we're acknowledging it to be. You know, it's more about us, you know, it's more about where we are. And it's a help, helpful model, I think, for where we are for those questions, but yeah. So, so just to clarify, Jeremy, are you saying that like, it, it, the model is helpful for kind of our time period, but, but it doesn't map onto history as well, but maybe for people in our society who, who like, like me and Kate were talking about, 
it could be it could be helpful because they're still ensconced in a 2019 context where we're using these maps and models. So it has yeah, practical it, utility yeah. in that context. It, I think it has very practical utility in in the existential conditions of the perspectival world that we're all in, and it could be helpful. And and it's better and framed in that way because it, it's deflated, it's not totalizing. And I think it's, it could be a little dangerous. And a lot of the critiques of spiral dynamics have been like, you know, coming from that kind of angle, like, okay, so you're saying, you know, uh, let's say Egypt is, is more at the amber and we're kind of high, okay, that's getting weird and it's getting into kind of the colonial aspect and sort of, you know, the advancement of of Eurocentrist, you know, like they're all of those things get tangled up in it when we inflate it. So why don't we just localize it and describe it as sort of um, a helpful model for the, the the existential conditions of the perspectival world, you know, um, so. Yeah, I'm glad you say that because I always had a problem with the, you know, with the um, uh, levels of development, then they say that's only from Renaissance on. And when you say Renaissance, is let's say the 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 turning point into a, a, a exaggeration of of the same which was there already before, and we we sort of deny that there were many things already that people were very smart in a different way before, and I always thought that is a little bit strange that we say oh they are beige and they then then they begin to have uh, some tools and then you know. There were so many, many moments when I thought something isn't, isn't fitting into my understandings, like, like holes, you know. And then I, I come across you and your ideas and I have the impression I cannot pick it re together yet or tie it together. But I have the impression, oh, you are addressing some of these moments where I thought, I don't get it really. It, it seems not not to make sense in 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 some way. So I'm really grateful for that. I haven't got it together yet, you know. But uh, maybe I never will. But the idea that spiral dynamics is be used for today's situation, I think this is a real good good idea. And why do we need to explain everything from millions of years ago with the same thing, which we explain our Western, westernized world of today. So, I never yeah. viewed it as like a historical thing, more as much as a psychological thing. You know, like if you, mm. you said Maslow's hierarchy needs, I'm not over the, you know, survival level. If I'm out in my, you know, my car breaks down in the middle of the wilderness, I mean, or even on the daily basis of like sometimes I just want to lay around and, you know, beige out or something. You know, it's not like, you know, it's just, it's, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, don't, I never view it as like, oh, that's only for prehistoric people, the beige, yeah. or babies, or little infants, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's or, good. Or, or, or any of those. You know. <laughs> I, I, I wish there was more of that attitude because I've just come across a lot of that in the, in the integral theory community where there, there's a lot of like, that's not me. That's very, that's very amber. That's very green. You know, that's very orange. And, and there's a, the, the descriptions I've found to be the most telling, and this is where it clicked for me, the fact that we're, we're describing things as, oh, this came online about 5,000 years ago and it has to do with this and tribal societies were fighting that that kind of the distance from it to me actually is very telling it's it's, it's revealing that it's coming from a very modern very late point of view looking back at everything and interpreting from its vantage point and that's fine I think um, but when we bring it all up into the contemporary then it's a mirror for like you're saying our psychological states our, our social conditions um, you know and, and it's more helpful that way, so. Um, okay. To play, to play devil's advocate, it's like, one of the things I like about the quadrants is the fact that, and uh, I can't remember exactly what they are, but they, they kind of map these structures on top of each stage. So it's kind of like, you have an upper left, for example, with beige, you'd have an upper right version of beige. So I don't know exactly what that is. Um, I think hunting and gathering is basically running around with sticks and digging stuff up and 
foraging and all this kind of thing. Um, so I, I agree with, I agree with what everybody's saying about the sort of, uh, arrogance sometimes of integral of kind of like, oh, that's beige, that's green or whatever. Um, but I think the historical context is, is pretty great and, um, seems kind of accurate to me. And also I kind of, I do like the fact that they are seemingly mapped between all the quadrants. Like that it's not, it's not that, um, you can't have a beige consciousness or, or whatever it is, but we don't generally have so much of a beige lower right or upper right in the same way that um, when it originated, you know, like um, when they're talking about cavemen and stuff, they couldn't fly to the moon or they'd never even heard of psychology and things like this. So it's kind of, um, I don't know, there's a, there's a rigor, there's a rigor that I like about it, even though I think it can be improved. Um, I think it's easy. It is easy to overgeneralize when you're when you're trying to cover so much history, um, and and so much with like the four quadrants and stuff. Paul, a question: How do you know that they couldn't fly to the moon? I mean, they were in their dream states, and they were were flying to the moon or wherever, in a much different way than we understand it today. And that ties into what Jeremy says. We have a certain way of understanding today how the world is and how our consciousness is and how our understanding is and we think that's the only thing the only way to see the world but it's not so in in those times they they see the world in a completely different way and they were in their in their how can i say that we would call it dream but for them these states of uh, consciousness they are not dream they are reality for for certain people you know so I think we, we need to be very, very cautious of not uh, re referring our own way of seeing and thinking and, 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 and understanding to previous primitive states of, uh, uh, of, of humans. They, they just had a different way, but it doesn't mean it's less. <laughs> yeah. No, although, I mean, the, um, for example, because we're talking about the quadrants, I mean, it would be hard to justify that cavemen were f getting to the uh, the moon in the upper right, for example. Like, and I think to some extent, like if you treat it as upper left through all the stages, it's kind of, I don't know, I like that because I assume that caveman state of consciousness is different to mythic and magic, and definitely seems different to red. Um, so, I, I yeah, I don't know. I guess it's a the upper right was maybe the sweat lodges or things like that, uh, practices they did from, you know, uh, it, it is a different, different tools in the upper right and different, uh, different things there than we have today. And also the lower right is different, but there, there was one. <laughs> so, no, the whole thing I want to say, we have to be more careful. And thanks to Jeremy, I, I was reminded to that that we always project our own understanding on whatever comes before and whatever comes ne next. And this is also probably a, a problem why we cannot meet the challenges of our times today, because we are still in, in certain ways of thinking and perceiving and, and, and imagining. We cannot imagine the unimaginable, uh, except some genius. Uh, people, you know, but we generally think that's what it is, and as far as as we can project, but we cannot open up as much as we would need to. That's my idea. So, I did have one helpful way that I use the quadrants, just to be pragmatic, and that's in conflict. I would just draw a square, and then I would listen to what people were saying, and I would mark where they were coming from. Are they coming from the subjective? Are they coming from the social justice warrior? You know, are they coming from talking systems? Are they coming from talking, you know, behaviors? Whatever they're talking about and just start marking it. And oftentimes in conflict, well, I only did it like 10 or 15 times. There was one missing that they were just stuck going like this. You know, a lot of times with the lower left to the upper right, you know, they were just talking like that or subjective was totally missing, or systems was missing, or the lower left was missing. They were just talking, eh, eh, you know, my feelings, my feelings, my feelings. And it was like, and then if you just come in with the other piece that's missing, something, it just happened that people got a little more relaxed. 
because it was like they were fighting on something, but the whole thing wasn't there. The whole picture wasn't there. It was kind of, it's kind of an interesting, it's real simple. Just make like a little scorecard. <laughs> Listen that reminds to me of Jeannie Wheel's um, interview with, with Rebel Wisdom, where he was talking about that. They, they, they started to use the Aqua model for their business clients and, and they, they, they had to simplify it. They're like, ultimately we just started using real simple. It's, it's, it's like building blocks. And then we had to revise everything else, but we kept that. And it seems yeah. like that's what I hear a lot from people. Yeah. That's useful. This is probably one of my favorite Sunday calls uh, we've ever done. Um, it, it, sound, it kind of was becoming kind of crossfire-y, which is, you know, what I like, um, you know, uh, but I'm kind of wondering too, if some of these topics want to be explored. I mean, everyone said something where I could talk to three hours to each one of you about these things um, and, and kind of explore them more in depth. And um, I forgot, actually forgot what I was going to say other than that I was really happy that I, I really like how this has been going. <laughs> Agreed, Ryan. This was really fun. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed everyone's perspectives and the new person too, um, coming in there and, and, and doing a little crossfire about aqual and temporix. It's, it's, really, it's interesting. You know, I learned something from it. Yeah, and I always learn a lot from it. And also it helps me to, to I don't want to say clarify my ideas because I'm far from clarified my ideas, but uh, to get more, more pieces and, and trying to put them, you know, like a puzzle, you know, a puzzle. You, you, you try out or put that piece here or here or here and maybe at the end comes the picture and I love that. And also we were less today. In some way it was for me less, um, how do you say, less diversive. Do you say diversive in this case? Yeah. Uh, and also sometimes, oh, what can we say now? Because normally somebody else comes in and, and jumps in and brings something new. And we were, oh, this is, yeah, Jimmy. <laughs> and uh, we sometimes were only in four. And so we, we, we went ahead and we found our way to, to do that. And interesting things came in. And then Kate came and bring, bring some new wind into that. And I, I, I love these dynamics, you know, and also to observe how, how they go on. So I thank you also for that, apart from the content we have talked about. A shame, Kate, that you didn't get the right moment. We have Sunday an hour earlier and Thursday we have an hour so to, later in respect to Sunday. So. Yeah, and that's my check out. Uh, who is missing? Kate and Paul, I think. Uh, I'll, I'll go there. I have oh. to watch the video. Um, yeah, I kind of, I don't know, I kind of like sometimes how simple integral can be, the maps. Like I find uh, sometimes I go on these calls, I think states is one of them. I think, do we do lines? I forget. Um, and I think, oh, I don't really know that much, or I don't necessarily think it's that useful or something. And then everybody gets talking and it gets like really, uh, fleshed out. And I kind of enjoy, I guess I enjoyed it on this one as well, where, um, Aqua as a principle is quite simple, but actually wrestling with the territories where, uh, all the work is kind of done. And I think like, um, this cause the same. And I often find it where it's like people have these mix of like razor sharp points and also just fumbling around and i sort of find both of them um really useful because i think some i guess both sides of it seem fitting for the sort of growth journey that sometimes you have really strong insights and sometimes you are just like uh fumbling in the dark just kind of uh, as you said heidi kind of trying to fix this puzzle together and uh you don't have to get all the pieces right. It's sort of like, even if you just get one at times, it can feel pretty potent. So it, it felt like a, like a nice mix of, uh, of all that. If you are muted in case you wanted to speak.
No checkout, Kate. So. <laughs> I said something. Sorry, I'm really off today. Yeah, I'm sorry I missed it. I'll, I look forward to watching the video. Enjoy this okay. call. So we are at the end. And as always, I'm, I'm happy that you are here with me because that's the sort of conversation is what I'm longing for, which I don't have around here in my area. And if I, if I uh, succeed to sell my house, then I will go in a place where we can have these conversations in, in person. It's really, I want to learn more. And this is for me an occasion. And I'm very grateful for that. And we see you with Ryan on Thursday and with me next Sunday. I mean, I will be on Thursday too. But... Thanks and bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>